Dear Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the blessings that you have given us this day and also the gift of faith. Help us to cherish and hang on to this faith as we dive into your word. Uh, make us more confident in what you have done so that we may be bold to tell others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We are getting to the end. Um, of, so we're in 1 Timothy chapter 6, 6 through 10. This is just a little bit of a review. Uh, just a little bit of a segue just from last week into this week. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Okay, we kind of covered this off last week where we we're just talking about what does it mean to be content? And being content basically means to be satisfied with what you have. Okay? So that your longings are not taking you away from God. Okay? So there's nothing wrong with having ambitions. So if you have ambitions, you know, and you want to go and do something or start something or excel in something, nothing wrong with that as long as it does not pull you away from God and, if I just may also say, the other responsibilities that uh, you have. Okay. Uh, but the St. Paul continues, he says, For we brought nothing into the world, we can take nothing out of the world. Beautiful uh, like paraphrase of uh, Job there. But if we have food and clothing, we can, we will be uh, content. And, you know, my, my typical joke about that is uh, Paul must not have raised very many teenagers. <laughs> you have food, you have clothing, aren't you content? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, never mind, having just raised uh, a couple of teenagers and now out of that stage, I can say in today's world, that's going to be uh, a tough sell. But those who desire to be rich, and again, that's going to fall into... Um, the category of pulling themselves such a strong desire that they pull themselves away from God, fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Now, he, he clarifies this for the love of money. Okay? And that's where that love of money is now pulling you away from God is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. It's interesting that we're going to be starting the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, which uh, is almost like starts the same way as this section here. So it's again, it's a, a good parallel. Picking up of uh, what Luther said, uh, and again, we covered this last week, but again, it's a, a good quote. Those who immerse them, who are immersed in the pursuits of money cannot pray, give thanks, or hear the word of God if so much as a penny is taken from them. <laughs> so that's it. And so, yes, if anything is taken from them. <clears throat> and I'm actually going to even then say, I, I like this idea of Luther so much, I want to just change money for a moment for something else. What about when somebody <coughs> sins against you? Can you find it in your heart to continue to pray, give thanks, and hear the Word of God when somebody sins against you? Or is when somebody sins against you so great of a concept that you can do nothing but just sort of sit there and stew and hold a grudge and not even acknowledge God. So it's not just with money, but it can just be about with anything where it just consumes you so much that if you've been wronged, you cannot uh, see God anymore, so to speak. Yeah, but if you have revenge and you're going to destroy that person with your mouth, that's pretty bad. You're right. Revenge is not something that we should be doing. That's why God says, uh, vengeance is mine. Okay? That's something that le is left up to God because there are some things that are more important in life. And that's a, that's a good illustration, John, because um, to a person who's fitting in this Luther quote right now, that one little penny is separating that person from God. 
Likewise, if somebody wrongs us, that one little infraction can separate that person also from God. And is your eternal life and salvation really worth one penny or one person sinning against you? No. No. Okay. So again, I, I like this uh, Luther quote. It's one of those that i got to continue to hang on to. But let's go on into verse 11. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Okay, so St. Paul is pointing us the right direction. Pursue these things. This is what you are supposed to be pursuing. Okay? Not vengeance, but pursue the righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Sounds very similar to his uh, use of uh, the fruit of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Pursue these mm -hmm. things. And then he goes on and says, fight the good fight of the mm -hmm. faith. So th there is going to be a little bit of a battle going on here, okay? Uh, but you're hanging on to the fruit of the Spirit, so to speak, not necessarily the things of this world. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about uh, which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Ah, I like to use this uh, concept of a good confession in the presence of er many witnesses as uh, a way of taking a look also of what confirmation is. Because confirmation is nothing more than the renewal of those baptismal vows that were made upon you when you were probably an infant. Okay? And now you're saying uh, that this is now my faith and you do it publicly. Okay? It's kind of funny over the many years as being a pastor, many people have asked me, you know, can we do the baptism privately? And I'm thinking, why would you want to do a baptism privately? And they, they can come up with a whole bunch of other excuses and so forth down the line. But I usually say no. And the reason why is the church wants to celebrate with you God connecting with this child. Likewise, would we ever want to do confirmation privately? Okay. Well, in, in today's world where, you know, people are not necessarily um, attacking Christians immediately, uh, there's no need to. But if we were living in a very hostile Christian environment, would you want to then take your confirmation privately? Well, possibly for that. But yet it's still, it's a public statement. It's a statement that says, this is what I believe. Okay. And are we ashamed of that faith? Well, as society puts more and more pressure upon us as Christians, we might be taking some steps back. But St. Paul urges us not to take steps back, but to continue in that faith, be steadfast in that faith, even if it means imprisonment, and make that good confession in the presence of many witnesses. John, question, comment? How can you have a baptism that is not... A commune type thing. It's not a real baptism unless... Oh, how can you have a baptism in like a private setting? Mm -hmm. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, it's, it's not what... I think baptism has to be a commune type thing. Oh, so you're saying God. baptisms should be uh, in part of the what mm -hmm. the church does and shouldn't be something that's done individually per mm -hmm. se. Right. Mm -hmm. And I would agree with you. Uh, it, it is part of this community of believers because as you are being baptized, you are being brought into the body of Christ. And the church is the body of Christ. And so why would you say, I want to be in the body of Christ, but I don't want to be part of this local body of Christ? And you're right, it doesn't make uh, much uh, sense. That's why I usually say uh, no to uh, the private baptisms. Um, but uh, has there ever been a time where I've had to be like in, in a hospital mm -hmm. labor and delivery room doing a baptism? Mm -hmm. The answer is yes. Mm -hmm. We're not going to say to that child, mm -hmm. whoops, I got to take you to the yeah. local church and mm -hmm. wait for the next church service because that particular time uh, the child would not have made it. So, yes. Linda. Each Sunday we make a good confession, I hope. Yes. So our brothers and sisters in Christ hear us. Maybe we should 
face the center aisle, actually face the others, and make our good confession as we speak to them, also as we uh, say it to God, but that they know what we're saying. Yes, they know, because they're saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. But I think there's an order of worship where there's a confession of sins, where the pastor speaks them first, and then the congregation forgives him. Right. Uh -huh. It's the order of compliment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me actually quick pull that up here. Um, and actually, hold on a second. Uh, I'm talking as I'm trying to quick uh, grab it here. Um, the one of the Wednesday evening services that I've done since I've been here, uh, I actually used part of this liturgy uh, for, from Compline for the Confession and Absolution uh, for a reason. Uh, and, oh, this is not going to show up. Hmm. Okay. It's not going to show up well, but I think we can kind of do this. Let me just change my screen here. Uh, so it might sound a little familiar to you, it, but it might not. Hold on a second. Let's pull this up here. I expand that yeah. I can. Yeah. We're going to focus, uh, LSB sometimes has two columns. Uh, we're going to focus on the left column. Notice uh, it's a little distorted. That's actually an L. Whoops. Okay. <laughs> Let me see if I can bring it up a little yeah. bit bigger. It says, I confess to God Almighty before the whole company of heaven and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned and thought word and deed by my fault by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault. Wherefore, I pray, God Almighty, to have mercy on me, forgive me all my sins, and bring me to everlasting life. Amen. So that's done by the leader. And because it's an L, you could actually use this in your family devotions. Okay? And wouldn't it be wonderful if a parent in a family devotion would say this, and then notice what the kids would have to say, or the congregation. The Almighty and Merciful Lord grant you pardon, forgiveness, and remission of all your sins. Amen. And then the, the congregation then continues. Uh, I confess to God Almighty before the whole company of heaven and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned in thought, word, and deed by my fault, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault. Wherefore, I pray God Almighty to have mercy on me, forgive me all my sins, and bring me to everlasting life. Amen. And then the re response of forgiveness, the Almighty and Merciful Lord grant you pardon, forgiveness, and remission of all your sins. So again, it is that uh, interaction between uh, the two. Um, I'm doing this from memory. Uh, I feel okay. like I've been in a confessional. Well, <laughs> that's about what we used to do. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with that. Now I have to get back to my computer here, so just give me a second here got to tell the TV to come back to the computer. Okay. So that is part of that good confession, is to be <coughs> able to be bold. Ah, my computer is not cooperating. There we go. There we go. Okay. Uh, to be bold in that uh, uh, witness. So, Linda, was that the, the thing that you were yes. thinking of? Right. Yes. Okay. And that is, uh, again, the confession absolution as part of the order of Compline. Um, and there, there's also one other little nuance to that, and I just forgot about it after I uh, uh, shut it down, was uh, it said, by my fault, by my own fault, phrase again, by my own uh, fault, by my own most grievous fault. Yeah. And um, that's actually called um, uh, the mea culpa, uh, mm -hmm. where it's basically I'm the culprit, that's how that's being translated. And during those times in the older liturgy, uh, you would actually take your fist and sort of beat it against your breast three times, yes. as you were saying now. Okay, yeah. Mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. Yeah. Um, and nothing wrong with that. There's, you know, these traditions are there, uh, designed to teach us. And what is that designed to teach us? That, yes, I'm a sinner in need of God's grace. And should we ever be afraid of confessing being a sinner? Well, the answer to that is no, because if we are ever afraid of confessing being a sinner, what we're really saying is to God, I really don't want your forgiveness. Okay? 
But we got to remember, we have a loving, gracious God who mercifully forgives. So why would we ever want to be afraid of um, confessing our sins, knowing we know God's response? God's response is, you are forgiven. This is why Jesus was sent, to forgive you. So we should always be bold and uh, not ju and shouldn't be uh, hiding that. Now, I will admit, confessing sins to one another, um, that we get a little squeamish about, even more squeamish about, I should say. Um, but uh, St. Paul here is trying to encourage Timothy to make that good confession of uh, that uh, in the presence of many witnesses. So let's go on, and uh, we're, we're getting there to the end, almost to the end. I charge you, St. Paul writes, in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus, which he will display at the proper time. He who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who, see, who dwells in unapproachable light, um, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. It was just interesting on uh, last Sunday we were, when we were talking about in the book of Roman, uh, Revelation, sorry, uh, about the, the jewels and the, the light of God and the light of God uh, shining through the jewels and you're getting that prism effect with the rainbow and stuff like that. Uh, St. Paul picks up a little bit of that uh, when he describes it as uh, who dwells in unapproachable light. Mm -hmm. You can't see God directly. Uh, and that's why the, the jewels were there. To, uh, you know, you see the glory of God, but not directly. Uh, but anyway, getting back to this, um, to Timothy here. Uh, so you, you have the charge to um, follow the commandments, to follow that word of God. Verse 14, to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach. So we're forgiven from our sins. Amen. But we still use the commandments as a guide for our Christian living. Okay, And this is important. This is called the third use of the law. And that third use of the law is uh, there as a reminder for Christians. How, how should we be living our life? Okay, Yes, there's forgiveness through Christ, but at the same time, as we enjoy that forgiveness, we want to sit there and say, Okay, God, you know, I, I want to follow the path that you want me to go down. What does that path look like? Well, that's simple. Ten Commandments. Follow that path. Okay, got it. That should be our response. But unfortunately, in today's world, many, many Christians will sit there and say, the Ten Commandments are old. That's back in the Old Testament. We don't need to follow those anymore. And the answer mm -hmm. is no. St. Paul is reminding us in verse 14 to keep the commandment. Okay? And it's not just referring to this particular word, word, but it's also referring to all the commands of God. So let's back up to verse 13 there where he says, I charge in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. So what is this in reference to? Probably in John chapter 19, verse 11, Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Mm -hmm. This is what Luther had in mind in trying to answering that good confession. Uh, what, what's interesting about this uh, particular passage in John chapter 19, verse 11, is um, Jesus affirms the authority of Pontius Pilate. You have authority, okay? So, you know, Jesus was not here to destroy the governments, okay? And that's what some people thought, is that the Messiah would come to kick out the Romans, okay? And usher in a new Jewish kingdom. And the answer to that is no, Jesus came to do something else. To defeat sin, death, and the devil, give you forgiveness of sins so that you could have life and salvation. 
Okay, so that was uh, what Jesus came to defeat, the enemy. The local governments are not the enemy. Okay, so again, he has uh, uh, that uh, affirmation of the authority, uh, but yet also then names the person who delivered me over to you as the greater sin. Okay, and so yes, there's still God is uh, holding sin accountable. Okay. It's been, the law has been completely fulfilled in Christ, and he will actually hold uh, Christ uh, accountable uh, to him. So now here comes the interesting question I always like to kind of um, uh, make Christians think about. So when Jesus dies on the cross, did he die on the cross for the forgiveness of Judas, Judas's sins, especially that sin of betraying him? When you get to this verse here, therefore he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Uh, no. He God forgives for everybody. all sins. He he said, everything. No. I think the answer is no, isn't it? But Judas if has to repent. repent. Right. Okay. <laughs> so we got a division in the house. Let's unpack <laughs> this a little bit. First of all, when Jesus dies on the cross, does he not die for the forgiveness of the sins of the whole entire world? Yes. yes. Okay. So, when we, we look at Calvary's cross and we look at Good Friday, okay, we see God's plan of salvation, it is finished. It is complete. How do we receive that forgiveness of sins that was won for us on Calvary's cross? Confession. Free gift. Okay. Believing in Jesus. Okay, uh, and let me sort of uh, summarize everything I just got through hearing, is we receive it through God's Word, as that Word is being proclaimed and administered in the sacraments. Okay, so this is the purpose and why we gather here at Peace Lutheran Church, to receive the gifts of God, because it is a free gift. It was one for us on Calvary's cross, but how do we receive it? We receive it when that Word of God is being proclaimed. We receive it when that Word of God touches us through water. We receive it when that Word of God, uh, when, uh, through bread and wine, the very true body and blood of Christ, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This is how we receive that Word of God. So is going to church, surrounding ourselves with God's gifts of Word and sacrament important? The answer is yes. That's the physical part. It is. There's got to be a physical part, right? The physical part, as you yeah. as you just quickly noted, uh, you're you're hearing God's word. Uh, uh, you you can touch that through water, bread, and wine. Okay, uh, and that's actually when I do baptisms. I, I like to use my hand, dip it into the water, and make sure I get lots of lots of water, not to get the kid extremely soaked, but so that some of it falls back into the baptismal font, and you hear the water, at least if you're closer to the front. Uh, likewise, in the Lord's Supper, uh, uh, and I had one uh, member in my previous parish, it was during the summertime, um, and we, I took the veil off over the elements, and she was sitting somewhere near the front, and she said, you know, I could actually smell the sweetness of the wine mm -hmm. starting to come forward. Okay, so can you smell the, the wine? And the answer mm -hmm. is yes. Okay, don't ask about the wafers. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, and so it is using your senses besides tasting. Okay. Uh, and so, you know, coming to Peace Lutheran Church to receive the gifts of God, as John, I think you were kind of alluding to, is also physical besides just spiritual. Okay. And that we have to realize that God is doing an awful lot with that word as it is being proclaimed and attached to water, bread, and wine. Okay, let's go to First Timothy chapter 6, 17 and through 19. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. So again, the key is God. God is going to save you. The things of this world, whether you have a lot or a little, are not. Who richly provides us 
with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Okay, now I will admit, now verses like this sometimes make uh, Lutherans a little uh, squirmish here. Because we're thinking, well, aren't we saved by justification by God's grace through faith? And the answer is yes. But as you're going to hear in the upcoming sermon, okay, it is a yes, amen to that, yes. Now comes the question, with the power of God's word, are we changed? Oh, yes, we are changed. Mm -hmm. Not by any change I've done, the change that God has done within me. Okay? And because of that change, do good works follow? Yeah. The answer is yes. So I'm going to take a quote from our uh, confessions, Augsburg Confession, uh, concerning uh, new obedience, uh, 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 Article 6. It is also taught that such faith should yield good fruit and good works, and that a person must do such good works as God has commanded for God's sake, but not place trust in them as if thereby to earn grace before God. For if we receive forgiveness of sin and righteousness through faith in Christ, as Christ says, uh, himself says in Luke chapter 17, verse 10, when you have done all things, say, we are worthless slaves. The fathers also teach the same thing, for Ambrose says, it is determined by God that whoever believes in Christ shall be saved and have forgiveness of sins, not through works, but through faith alone, without merit. So in, in the confessions, we, we actually do spell this out because this is something that can get confused really, really quickly. Are good works necessary? The answer is yes. Are you saved by those good works? The answer is no. Okay. So let's just go back here uh, to uh, when he was talking about verse uh, 18. They are to do good to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Okay, so St. Paul is already basically saying that these people are already believers. They've been blessed by God. They should be sharing uh, with what God has uh, blessed them with. Okay, and we should all really be rich in good works, um, generous to help out where we can. You know, if God didn't bless us with $10 million, obviously we can't give $10 million, right? Okay, so keep that in mind that God does indeed bless us with many things, and uh, notice the emphasis, be ready to uh, share. Um, and does that help build you could say that, I don't want to say build faith, because faith is a gift from God, but then you're trusting that faith even more. You're saying, yes, you know God is taking care of you, and that God can use you to help take care of other people, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and it gives us a little bit more confidence in that Christian faith, especially in today's world, where in today's world everyone is sitting there going, it's mine, mine, and all mine, and you can't have it. In the Christian world, we sit there and say, no, it's God's, God's, it's all God's. I'm just a manager or a steward of God's possessions. Two different lines of thought here. Okay, let's uh, finish this up. Last two verses. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. And you might be saying, wow, didn't we hear that last week in the sermon? Mm -hmm. And that was from 2 Timothy. So you... Paul's use of this guarding the deposit was important to put into both letters. Okay, And then he goes on and says, Avoid the irrever uh, irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. 
for by professing it some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. And you're like, wow, what a way to end. Uh, a little bit on a, a rough note, but that's okay. Uh, he's basically saying, guard that faith. Guard that faith that has been given to you by the Holy Spirit. Don't go looking out for other type of sources of wisdom or knowledge or strength. Stick to God's Word. Okay? Because if you start looking for wisdom and other things, you're going to wander from the faith. And then he ends up by saying, uh, grace be uh, with you. Uh, one little last interesting note about knowledge. Okay? Yes. So, and here's something that the church has uh, not... Well, I guess even Lutherans struggled with it at one time. Uh, not so much uh, nowadays, but we had a, a very uh, not good struggle with it. We had to deal with the concept of faith that trusts God's Word and our reason. Okay? What do we do when we come to certain Bible passages that we read it and it just doesn't make sense? There are two options here. Okay? One is to say... This is God's Word. Maybe God will reveal the answer later. Maybe God won't reveal the answer at all. Uh, maybe I'm just supposed to struggle with this, but well, you just sort of struggle and continue to go. Or, the other point, way of looking at this is, God's Word has got to be wrong because my reason has got to be right. Mm -hmm. And so, henceforth, we got to just rearrange what God is trying to say in His Word to fit my reason. And I can already see the responses. Everyone's going no to that last one, Pastor, okay? But strangely enough, we live in a world where there are actually many churches that will go down that route. If something doesn't seem to make sense to them, then they are going to try to explain it. Okay? And I think I just recently did some teaching on this um, in regards to, uh, especially to the Lord's Supper. Okay? Uh, when we teach the Lord's Supper, we talk about the bread and wine and the body and blood of Jesus. Okay? We don't try to explain how this happens. Okay? As Lutherans, we just teach what happens. Okay? So, what happens? You have bread and wine. You have God's Word, you have the body and blood of Christ. Christ is bodily present. And you receive Christ bodily with that bread and wine, the body and blood of Christ, when you receive communion. Do, we don't try to go down the route with how it changes, or, or what goes on, or how it all happens, okay? And so we just leave that as a mystery. I'm not going to touch that. Because if I touch it, I'm going to go down a path that Scripture doesn't want me to go down. If God wanted me to know all the details behind it, He would have spelled out the details. He wanted me to know what you receive. You receive Christ, body and blood. You receive that bread and wine. But it is the body and blood of Christ. Okay. And I will admit, that has got to be one of the hardest parts, along with the Holy Trinity, that we worship one God, three persons, and our reason within us just wants to sit there and says, this doesn't make sense. Great. Notice what I'm doing is I'm keeping the authority of God's word above my reason. Okay. But yet I can still take a look at Paul's letters here. I can do some comparison and contrasting between the first letter of Timothy to the second letter of Timothy. I can, you know, unpack the Greek a little bit and do language studies, and we can use all those aspects of reason. But notice with all those aspects of reason, I'm still keeping God's Word intact. And I'm never putting myself above God's Word, but I'm just trying to sit there and say, okay, what is God trying to teach me through this Word? Okay, John, a question. If comment. you can explain that, you I'd like to be there when you explain the first miracle. <laughs> Which miracle are you referring to as the first miracle? The very first miracle. Creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you could explain the other, you could explain that. Let me tell you. Um, <coughs> all I can say is, what happened? God created. 
-hmm. How it happened, I'm not going to explain it, except for he spoke. <coughs> the scripture does give us that. And so as Christians, what I like about that question, John, is, again, we take with God's word gifts to us. We don't sit there and say, uh, and start, we don't start getting speculative with it. We just take it and say, this is what God wants to reveal to us. This is what's revealed. Thank you, God. Okay. How, come yeah. they, um. how come they never questioned Jesus Christ when he changed water to wine? Oh, many people do question that. <laughs> many do. Pe many people do question the water into wine. Okay, Linda. When I was going through confirmation <coughs> instruction, so zillions of years ago, um, in the explanation of the Lord's Supper, with some one of the Bible verses, I had sacramental eating and drinking. Since that um, catechism has been reprinted, and some additional things added. They no longer have that sacramental eating and drinking. And I think that explains a lot to people what happens to the bread and the wine. Well, you're eating it and drinking it sacramentally. Don't explain that one. But, you know, it, it does explain a little bit to, at least it did to me when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. But nowadays those words are not in there. And I even talked to one of the professors at St. Louis when they were talking about it. He said, it's not? It's not in there? I was on that committee. On, when you find it, let me know. Anybody else find that explanation in the catechism now? Let me know. I'd like to see it. I really want it to be in there. Let, let me dive into that. Um, I mean, because I have the latest uh, edition and I, I actually have uh, a couple of the various editions. But you got to remember the small catechism that was written by Luther is nothing more than right. six chief parts and yep. the uh, Luther's explanation to that. <laughs> the additional parts after that are things that the, the church have put together to kind of explain a little bit more to, uh, to today's age, so to speak, uh, and apply it a little bit differently. So let me take a look at the new catechism for that for you on that, Thank Linda, you. and get back to you on that. Okay, so we're going to make a little bit of a transition here.